Chapter Number Nineteen of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum hands in luck hans had served his master for seven years when he one day said to him master my time is up i want to go home to my mother please give me my wages his master answered you have served me well and faithfully and as the service has been so shall the wages be and he gave him a lump of gold as big as his head hans took out his pocket handkerchief and tied up the gold in it and then slung the bundle over his shoulder and started on his homeward journey as he walked along just putting one foot before the other a man on horseback appeared riding gaily and merrily along on his capering steed ah said hans quite loud as he passed what a fine thing riding must be you are as comfortable as if you were in an armchair you don't stumble on any stones you save your shoes and you get over the road you hardly know how the horseman who heard him stopped and said hello hans why are you on foot i can't help myself said hans for i have this bundle to carry home it is true that it is a lump of gold but i can hardly hold my head up for it and it weighs down my shoulder frightfully i'll tell you what said the horseman we will change i will give you my horse and you shall give me your bundle with all my heart said hans but you will be rarely weighted with it the horseman dismounted took the gold and helped hans up put the bridle into his hands and said when you want to go very fast you must click your tongue and cry gee up gee up hans was delighted when he found himself so easily riding along on horseback after a time it occurred to him that he might be going faster and he began to click with his tongue and cry gee up gee up the horse broke into a gallop and before hans knew where he was he was thrown off into a ditch which separated the fields from the high road the horse would have run away if a peasant coming along the road leading a cow had not caught it hans felt himself all over and picked himself up but he was very angry and said to the peasant riding is poor fun at times when you have a nag like mine which stumbles and throws you and puts you in danger of breaking your neck i will never mount it again i think much more of your cow there you can walk comfortably behind her and you have her milk into the bargain every day as well as butter and cheese what would i not give for a cow like that well said the peasant if you have such a fancy for it as all that i will exchange the cow for the horse hans accepted the offer with delight and the peasant mounted the horse and rode rapidly off hans drove his cow peacefully on and thought what a lucky bargain he had made if only i have a bit of bread and i don't expect ever to be without it i shall always have butter and cheese to eat with it if i am thirsty i only have to milk my cow and i have milk to drink my heart what more can you desire when he came to an inn he made a halt and in his great joy he ate up all the food he had with him all his dinner and his supper and he gave the last coins he had for half a glass of beer 
then he went on farther in the direction of his mother's village driving the cow before him the heat was very oppressive and as midday drew near hans found himself on a heath which it took him over an hour to cross he was so hot and thirsty that his tongue was parched and clung to the roof of his mouth this can easily be set to rights thought hans i will milk my cow and sup up the milk he tied her to a tree and as he had no pail he used his leather cap instead but try as hard as he liked not a single drop of milk appeared as he was very clumsy in his attempts the impatient animal gave him a severe kick in the forehead with one of her hind legs he was stunned by the blow and fell to the ground where he lay for some time not knowing where he was happily just then a butcher came along the road trundling a young pig in a wheelbarrow what is going on here he cried as he helped poor hans up hans told him all that had happened the butcher handed him his flask and said here take a drink it will do you good the cow can't give any milk i suppose she must be too old and good for nothing but to be a beast of burden or go to the butcher oh dear said hans smoothing his hair now who would ever have thought it killing the animal is all very well but what kind of meat will it be for my part i don't like cow's flesh it's not juicy enough now if one had a nice young pig like that it would taste ever so much better and then all the sausages listen hans then said the butcher for your sake i will exchange and let you have the pig instead of the cow god reward your friendship said hans handing over the cow as the butcher untied the pig and put the halter with which it was tied into his hand hans went on his way thinking how well everything was turning out for him even if a mishap befell him something else immediately happened to make up for it soon after this he met a lad carrying a beautiful white goose under his arm they passed the time of day and hans began to tell him how lucky he was and what successful bargains he had made the lad told him that he was taking the goose for a christening feast just feel it he went on holding it up by the wings feel how heavy it is it is true they have been stuffing it for eight weeks whoever eats that roast goose will have to wipe the fat off both sides of his mouth yes indeed answered hans weighing it in his hand but my pig is no lightweight either then the lad looked cautiously about from side to side and shook his head now look here he began i don't think it is all quite straight about your pig one has just been stolen out of schultz's sty in the village i have come from i fear i fear it is the one you are leading they have sent people out to look for it and it would be a bad business for you if you were found with it the least they would do would be to put you in the black hole poor hans was very much frightened at this oh dear oh dear he said do help me out of this trouble you are more at home here take my pig and let me have your goose well i shall run some risk if i do but i won't be the means of getting you into a scrape so he took the rope in his hand and quickly drove the pig up a side road and honest hans relieved of his trouble plodded on with the goose under his arm 
when i really come to think it over he said i have still had the best of the bargain first there is the delicious roast goose and then all the fat that will drip out of it in cooking will keep us in goose fat to eat on our bread for three months at least and last of all there are the beautiful white feathers which i will stuff my pillow with and then i shall need no rocking to send me to sleep how delighted my mother will be as he passed through the last village he came to a knife grinder with his cart singing to his wheel as it buzzed merrily around scissors and knives i grind so fast and hang up my cloak against the blast hans stopped to look at him and at last he spoke to him and said you must be doing a good trade to be so merry over your grinding yes answered the grinder the work of one's hands has a golden foundation a good grinder finds money wherever he puts his hand into his pocket but where did you buy that beautiful goose i did not buy it i exchanged my pig for it and the pig oh i got that instead of my cow and the cow i got that for a horse and the horse i gave a lump of gold as big as my head for it and the gold oh that was my wages for seven years service you certainly have known how to manage your affairs said the grinder now if you could manage to hear the money jingling in your pockets when you got up in the morning you would indeed have made your fortune how shall i set about that asked hans you must be a grinder like me nothing is needed for it but a whetstone everything else will come of itself i have one here which certainly is a little damaged but you need not give me anything for it but your goose are you willing how can you ask me such a question said hans why i shall be the happiest person in the world if i can have some money every time i put my hand in my pocket what more should i have to trouble about so he handed him the goose and took the whetstone in exchange now said the grinder lifting up an ordinary large stone which lay near the ground here is another good stone into the bargain you can hammer out all your old nails on it to straighten them take it and carry it off hans shouldered the stone and went on his way with a light heart and his eyes shining with joy i must have been born in a lucky hour he cried everything happens just as i want it and as it would happen to a sunday's child in the meantime as he had been on foot since daybreak he began to feel very tired and he was also very hungry as he had eaten all his provisions at once in his joy at his bargain over the cow at last he could hardly walk any farther and he was very obliged to stop every minute to rest then the stones were frightfully heavy and he could not get rid of the thought that it would be very nice if he were not obliged to carry them any farther he dragged himself like a snail to a well in the fields meaning to rest and refresh himself with a draught of the cold water so as not to injure the stones by sitting on them he laid them carefully on the edge of the well then he sat down and was about to stoop down to drink when he inadvertently gave them a little push and both the stones fell straight into the water when hans saw them disappear before his very eyes he jumped for joy and then knelt down and thanked god with tears in his eyes for having shown him this further grace and relieved him of the heavy stones 
which were all that remained to trouble him without giving him anything to reproach himself with there is certainly no one under the sun so happy as i he said and so with a light heart free from every care he bounded on home to his mother end of chapter nineteen read by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter twenty of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by annie hill tales of laughter by wiggin and smith the family servants where are you going to to valpi i to valpi you to valpi so so together we go have you got a husband how do you call your husband cham my husband cham your husband cham i to valpi you to valpi so so together we go have you got a child how do you call your child grilled my child grilled your child grilled my husband cham your husband cham i to valpi you to valpi so so together we go have you got a cradle how do you call your cradle hippodaddle my cradle hippodaddle your cradle hippodaddle my child grilled your child grilled my husband cham your husband cham i to valpi you to valpi so so together we go have you got a man how do you call your man do as well as you can my man do as well as you can your man do as well as you can my cradle hippodaddle your cradle hippodaddle my child grilled your child grilled my husband cham your husband cham i to valpi you to valpi so so together we go End of chapter 20chapter 21 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dale grothman tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter 21 the flail which came from the clouds a countryman once drove his plow with a pair of oxen and when he came about the middle of his fields the horns of his two beasts began to grow and grow till they were so high that when he went home he could not get them into the stable door by good luck just then a butcher passed by to whom he gave up his beasts and struck a bargain that he should take to the butcher a measureful of turnip seed for each grain of which the butcher should give him a bravant dollar that is what you might call a good bargain the countryman went home and came again carrying on his back a measure of seed out of which he dropped one grain on the way the butcher however reckoned out for every seed a barbant dollar and had not the countryman lost one he would have received a dollar more meanwhile the seed which he had dropped on the road had grown up to a fine tree reaching into the clouds so the countryman thought to himself he might as well see what the people in the clouds were about up he climbed and at the top he found a field with some people thrashing oats but while he was looking at them he felt the tree shake beneath him and peeping downward he perceived that some one was on the point of chopping down the tree at the roots if i am thrown down said the countryman to himself i shall have a bad fall and quite bewildered he could think of nothing else to save him than to make a rope with the oat straw which lay about in heaps he then seized hold of a hatchet and a flail which were near him and let himself down by his straw rope he fell into a deep deep hole in the earth and found it very lucky that he had brought the hatchet with him for with it he cut steps and soon mounted again into the broad daylight 
bringing with him the flail for a sign of the truth of his tale, which nobody, on that account, was able to doubt. There is a wonderful adventure. End of chapter 21 The Flail Which Came from the Clouds Chapter 22 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 22 The Soul's Mouth. The fishes once grew very discontented, because no order was kept in their dominions. None turned aside for the others, but each swam right or left just as it pleased him, sometimes between those who wished to be together, or else pushed them to one side, and the stronger ones gave the weaker blows with their tails, which made them get out of the way as fast as they could, or else they devoured them without more ceremony. How nice it would be, thought the fishes, if we had a king who should exercise the power of judging between us. And so at last they assembled together to choose a lord, who should be he who could swim the quickest and render help best to the weaker fishes. So they laid themselves all in rank and file by the shore, and the pike gave a signal with his tail, on which they started off like an arrow darted away the pike closely followed by the herring the gudgeon the perch the carp and the rest even the soul swam among them hoping to gain the prize all at once a cry was heard the herring is first the herring is first who is first asked the flat envious soul in a vexed tone who is first the herring the herring was the reply the naked herring the naked herring cried the soul disdainfully and ever since that time the soul's mouth has been all awry as a punishment for his wicked envy end of chapter twenty two recording by christine layman reseda california Chapter Twenty Three of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Three Brothers. There was once a man who had three sons, but no fortune except the house he lived in. Now each of them wanted to have the house after his death, but their father was just as fond of one as the other, and did not know how to treat them all fairly. He did not want to sell the house, because it belonged to his forefathers, or he might have divided the money between them. At last an idea came into his head and he said to his sons go out into the world and each learn a trade and when you come home the one who makes the best use of his handicraft shall have the house the sons were quite content with this plan and the eldest decided to be a farrier the second a barber and the third a fencing master they fixed a time when they would all meet at home again and then they set off it so happened each found a clever master with whom they learned their business thoroughly the farrier shod the king's horses and he thought i shall certainly be the one to have the house the barber shaved nobody but grand gentlemen so he thought it would fall to him the fencing master got many blows but he set his teeth and would not let himself be put out because he thought if I'm afraid of a blow, I shall never get the house. Now when the given time had passed, they all went home together to their father, but they did not know how to get a good opportunity of showing off their powers, and sat down to discuss the matter. 
Suddenly a hare came running over the field. Ah, cried the barber, she comes just in the nick of time. He took up his bowl and his soap and got his lather by the time the hare came quite close. Then he soaped her up in full career and shaved her as she raced along without giving her cut or missing a single hair. His father, astonished, said, If the others don't look out, the house will be yours. Before long, a gentleman came along in his carriage at full gallop. Now, father, you shall see what I can do, said the farrier, and he ran after the carriage and tore the four shoes off the horse as he galloped along, then, without stopping a second, shod him with new ones you are a fine fellow indeed said his father you know your business as well as your brother i don't know which i shall give the house to at this rate then the third one said let me have a chance too father as it was beginning to rain he drew his sword and swirled it round and round his head so that not a drop fell on him even when the rain grew heavier so heavy it seemed as if it was being poured from the sky out of buckets he swung the sword faster and faster and remained dry as if he had been under a roof his father was amazed and said you have done the best the house is yours both the other brothers were quite satisfied with this decision as they were all so devoted to one another they lived together in the house and carried on their trades by which they made plenty of money since they were so perfect in them they lived happily together to a good old age and when one fell ill and died the others grieved so much over him that they pined away and soon after departed this life then as they had been so fond of one another they were all buried in one grave End of chapter 23 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 24 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin The Wren and the Bear One summer day the bear and the wolf were walking in the forest, and the bear heard a bird singing very sweetly, and said, Brother Wolf, what kind of bird is that which is singing so delightfully? that is the king of the birds before whom we must do reverence replied the wolf but it was only the wren if that be so said the bear i should like to see his royal palace come lead me to it that cannot be as you like replied the wolf you must wait till the queen returns soon afterward the queen arrived with some food in her bill and the king too to feed their young ones and the bear would have gone off to see them but the wolf pulling his ear said no you must wait till the queen and the king are both off again so after observing well the situation of the nest the two tramped off but the bear had no rest for he wished still to see the royal palace and after a short delay he set off to it again he found the king and the queen absent and peeping into the nest he saw five or six young birds lying in it is this the royal palace exclaimed the bear this miserable place you are no king's children but wretched young brats no no that we are not burst out the little wrens together in a great passion for to them this speech was addressed no no we are born of honourable parents and you mr bear shall make your words good 
at this speech the bear and the wolf were much frightened and ran back to their holes but the little wrens kept up an unceasing clamour till their parents returned as soon as they came back with food in their mouths the little birds began we will none of us touch a fly's leg but will starve rather until you decide whether we are fine and handsome children or not for the bear has been here and insulted us be quiet replied the king and that shall soon be settled and thereupon he flew with his queen to the residence of the bear and called to him from the entrance old grumbler why have you insulted my children that shall cost you dear for we will decide the matter by a pitched battle war having thus been declared against the bear all the four-footed beasts were summoned the ox the ass the cow the goat the stag and every animal on the face of the earth the wren on the other hand summoned every flying thing not only the birds great and small but also the gnat the hornet the bee and the flies when the time arrived for the commencement of the war the wren king sent out spies to see who was appointed commander-in-chief of the enemy the gnat was the most cunning of all the army and he therefore buzzed away into the forest where the enemy was encamped and alighted on a leaf of the tree beneath which the watchword was given out there stood the bear and called the fox to him and said you are the most crafty of animals so you must be general and lead us on well said the fox but what sign shall we appoint nobody answered then the fox said i have a fine long bushy tail which looks like a red feather at a distance if i hold this tail straight up all is going well and you must march after me but if i suffer it to hang down run away as fast as you can as soon as the gnat heard all this she flew home and told the wren king everything to a hare when the day arrived for the battle to begin the four-foot beasts all came running along to the field shaking the earth with their roaring and bellowing the wren king also came with his army whirring and buzzing and humming enough to terrify any one out of his senses then the wren king sent the hornet forward to settle upon the fox's tail and sting it with all his power as soon as the fox felt the first sting he drew up his hind leg with the pain still carrying however his tail as high in the air as before at the second sting he was obliged to drop it a little bit but at the third he could no longer bear the pain but was forced to drop his tail between his legs as soon as the other beasts saw this they thought all was lost and began to run each one to his own hole so the birds won the battle without difficulty when all was over the wren king and his queen flew home to their children and cried out rejoice rejoice we have won the battle now eat and drink as much as you please the young wrens however said still we will not eat till the bear has come to our nest and begged pardon and admitted that we are fine and handsome children so the wren king flew back to the cave of the bear and called out old grumbler you must come to the nest and beg pardon of my children for calling them wretched young brats else your ribs shall be crushed in your body in great terror the bear crept out and begged pardon and afterward the young wrens being now made happy in their minds settled down to eating and drinking and i'm afraid they were over excited and kept up their merriment far too late end of chapter twenty four recording by linda marie nielsen 
Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 25 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in a public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wolfgang Bass. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and K. Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 25. The Musicians of Bremen. A certain man had a donkey that had served him faithfully for many long years, but whose strength was so far gone that at last he was quite unfit for work. So his master began to consider how much he could make of the donkey's skin, but the beast, perceiving that no good wind was blowing, ran away along the road to Bremen. There, thought he, I can be a town musician. When he had run some way, he found a hound lying by the roadside, yawning like one who was very tired. What are you yawning for, you big fellow? asked the ass. Oh, replied the hound, because every day I grow older and weaker, I cannot go any more to the hunt, and my master had well nigh beaten me to death, so that I took to flight, and now... I do not know how to earn my bread. Well, do you know, said the ass, I am going to Bremen to be a town musician there. Suppose you go with me and take a share in the music. I will play on the lute and you shall beat the kettle drums. The dog was satisfied and off they sat. Presently they came to a cat sitting in the middle of the pass with a face like three rainy days. Now then, old shaver, what has crossed you? asked the ass. Now, how can one be merry when one's neck has been pinched like mine? answered the cat. Because I'm growing old, and my teeth are all worn to stumps, and because I would rather sit by the fire and spin than run for a mice, my mistress wanted to drown me, and so I ran away. But now good advice is dear, and I do not know what to do. Go with us to Bremen. You understand nocturnal music, so you can be town musician. The cat consented and went with them. The three vagabonds soon came near the farmyard, where, upon the barn door, the cock was sitting crowing with all his might. You crow through marrow and bone, said the ass. What do you do that for? This is the way I prophesy fine weather, said the cock. But because grand guests are coming for the Sunday, the housewife has no pity and has told the cookmaid to make me into soup for the morrow, and this evening my head will be cut off. Now I'm crowing with full throat as long as I c c can. Oh, but you red come, replied the ass. Rather come away with us. We're going to Bremen to find her something better than death. You have a good voice, and if we make music together, it will have full play. The cock consented to this plan, and so all four traveled on together. They could not, however, reach Bremen in one day, and at the evening they came into a forest, where they meant to pass the night. The ass and the dog laid themselves down under a large tree. The cat and the cock climbed up into the branches, but the latter flew right to the top, where he was most safe. Before he went to sleep, he looked all around the four quarters, and soon thought he saw a little spark in the distance. So calling his companions, he said they were not far from a house, for he saw a light. 
the ass said if it is so we had better get up and go farther for the pasturage here is very bad and the dog continued yes indeed a couple of bones with some meat on would be very acceptable so they made haste toward the spot where the light was and which shone now brighter and brighter until they came to a well-lighted robber cottage the ass as the biggest went to the window and peeped in what do you see gray horse asked the cock what do i see replied the ass a table laid out with savoury meats and drinks with robbers sitting around enjoying themselves that would be the right sort of thing for us said the cock yes yes i wish we were there replied the ass then these animals took counsel together how they should contrive to drive away the robbers and at last they sought of a way the ass placed his forefeet upon the window ledge the hound got on his back the cat climbed up upon the dog and the last was the cock flew up and perched upon the head of the cat when this was accomplished at a given signal they commenced together to perform their music the ass prayed the dog barked the cat mute and the cock crew and they made such a tremendous noise and so loud that the panes of the window were shivered terrified at this unearthly sound the robbers got up with great precipitation thinking nothing less than that some spirit had come and they fled off into the forest so the four companions immediately sat down at the table and quickly ate up all that was left as if they had been fasting for six weeks as soon as they had finished they extinguished the light and each sought for himself a sleeping place according to his nature and custom the ass laid himself down upon some straw the hound behind the door the cat upon the hearth near the warm ashes and the cock flew up on a beam which ran across the room weary with their long walk they soon went to sleep at midnight the robbers perceived from their retreat that no light was burning in their house and all appeared quiet so the captain said we need not have been frightened into fits and calling one of the band he sent him forward to reconnoitre the messenger finding all still went into the kitchen to strike a light and taking the glistening and fiery eyes of the cat for live coals he held a lucifer match to them expecting it to take fire but the cat not understanding the joke flew in his face spitting and scratching which dreadfully frightened him so that he made for the back door but the dog who lay there sprang up and bit his leg and as he limped upon the straw where the ass was stretched out it gave him a powerful kick with its hind foot this was not at all for the cock awaking at the noise clapped his wings and cried from the beam cock a doodly do cock a doodly do then the robber ran back as well as he could to his captain and said oh my master there dwells a horrible witch in the house who spat on me and scratched my face with her long nails and then before the door stand a man with a knife who chopped at my leg and in the yard there lies a black monster who bit me with a great wooden club and besides all upon the roof sits a judge who called out bring the knife abdu bring the knife abdu so i ran away as fast as i could after this the robbers dared not again go near their house but everything prospered so well with the four town musicians of bremen that they did not forsake their situation and there they are to this day for anything i know End of chapter 25
Chapter Twenty Six of the Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Fox and the Cat. It happened once that the cat met Mr. Fox in the wood and because she thought he was clever and experienced in all ways of the world she addressed him in a friendly manner good morning dear mr fox how are you and how do you get along in these hard times the fox full of pride looked at the cat from head to foot for some time hardly knowing whether he would deign to answer or not at last he said oh you poor whiskered wiper you silly piebald you starveling mouse hunter what has come into your head how dare you ask me how i'm getting on what sort of education have you had how many arts are you master of only one said the cat meekly and what might that one be asked the fox when the dogs run after me i can jump into a tree and save myself is that all said the fox i am master of a hundred arts and i have a sack full of cunning tricks in addition but i pity you come with me and i will teach you how to escape from the dogs just then a huntsman came along with four hounds the cat sprang trembling into a tree and crept stealthily up to the topmost branch where she was entirely hidden by twigs and leaves open your sack mr fox open your sack cried the cat but the dogs had gripped him and held him fast oh mr fox cried the cat you with your hundred arts and your sack full of tricks are held fast while i with my one am safe had you been able to creep up here you would not have lost your life End of chapter twenty six Chapter number twenty seven of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The Golden Key one winter when a deep snow was lying on the ground a poor boy had to go out in a sledge to fetch wood as soon as he had collected together a sufficient quantity he thought that before he returned home he would make a fire to warm himself because his limbs were so frozen so sweeping the snow away he made a clear space and presently found a small gold key as soon as he picked it up he began to think that where there was a key there must also be a lock and digging in the earth he found a small iron chest i hope the key will fit thought he to himself there are certainly great treasures in this box he looked all over it but could not find any keyhole but at last he did discover one which was however so small that it could scarcely be seen he tried the key and behold it fitted exactly then he turned it once round and now if you will wait until he has quite unlocked it and lifted up the lid then we shall learn what wonderful treasures were in the chest end of chapter twenty seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter Twenty Eight of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter Twenty Eight. Doctor Know All. A long time ago, there lived a peasant named Crab 
who one day drove into a certain city his cart laden with a bundle of faggots drawn by two oxen he soon found a purchaser for his wood in the person of a learned doctor who bought it for two dollars and while the money was being counted out the peasant peeping in at the door saw how comfortably his customer was eating and drinking and the thought thereupon came into his head that he would like to be a professor too so he waited a little while and at last mustered courage to ask whether he could not be a doctor oh yes replied the doctor that can soon be managed what must i do asked the peasant first of all buy an a b c book one which has a cock a doodle doo for a frontispiece second sell your cart and oxen and turn them into money to buy good clothes with and what else belongs to a doctor's appearance lastly let a sign be painted with the words i am the doctor know-all and nail that over your house door the countryman did all that he was told and after he had practised a little time but not to much purpose a certain very wealthy baron had some money stolen from him mention was made to the baron of dr know-all who dwelt in such a village and who would be sure to know where the money was gone as soon as the baron heard of him he ordered his horses put to his carriage and drove to the place where the doctor lived the baron inquired if he were the doctor know-all and he replying yes the baron said he must return with him and discover his money very well replied the doctor but my wife gertrude must accompany me to this the baron agreed and all being seated in the carriage away they drove back again when they arrived at the house a splendid collation was on the table of which the doctor was invited to partake certainly said he but my wife gertrude too and he sat down with her at the bottom of the table as soon as the first servant entered with a dish of delicate soup the doctor poked his wife saying he is the first meaning he was the first who had brought the meat but the servant imagined he meant to say he is the first thief and because he really was so he felt very much disturbed and told his comrades in the kitchen the doctor knows all we shall come off badly for he has said i am the first when the second servant heard this he felt afraid to go but he was obliged and as soon as he entered the room with the dish the man poked his wife again and said gertrude that is the second this frightened the servant so much that he left the room as soon as possible and the third servant who entered fared no better for the doctor said to his wife that is the third the fourth servant had to bring in a covered dish and the baron said to the doctor he must show his powers by telling truly what was in the dish now there were crabs in it and the doctor looked at the dish for some minutes considering how to get out of the scrape at last he cried out oh poor crab that i am when the baron heard this he exclaimed good he knows it he knows too where my money is the servant however was terribly frightened and he winked to the doctor to follow him out when he had done so he found all four servants there who had stolen the money and were now so eager to get off that they offered him a large sum if he would not betray them for if he did their necks would be in danger they led him also to the place where the money was hid and the doctor was so pleased that he gave them the required promise and then returned to the house where he sat down again at table and producing his book said i will now look in my book baron and discover the place where the money lies a fifth servant who had had a share in the robbery wished to hear if the doctor knew more and so he crept up the chimney to listen below sat the countryman turning the leaves of his book backward and forward forward and backward looking for the cock a doodle doo however he could not find it and at length he exclaimed you must come out for i know you are in it this made the servant up the chimney believe he meant him and down he slipped and came out crying the man knows all the man knows all then dr know-all showed the baron where the money lay but he said nothing about who had stolen it 
so that from both sides he received a large sum of money as a reward, and, moreover, he became a very celebrated character. End of chapter 28Chapter twenty nine of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Tales of Laughter by Wigan and Smith. The Fair Catherine and Piff Paff Poultry. Good day, Father Holinthe. How do you do? very well i thank you piff paff poultry may i marry your daughter oh yes if the mother malko milk cow the brother huchenstolz high and mighty the sister kestrout cheese maker and the fair catherine are willing it may be so where is then the mother malko in the stable milking the cow good day mother malko how do you do very well i thank you piff paff poultry may i marry your daughter oh yes if the father holinthe the brother hochenstolt the sister geestraut and the fair catherine are willing it may be so where is then the brother hochenstolt in the yard chopping up the wood good day brother hochenstolt how are you very well i thank you piff paff poultry may i marry your sister oh yes if the father holinthe the mother malko and the sister kestrout and the fair catherine are willing it may be so where is then the sister kestrout in the garden cutting the cabbages good day sister kestrout how do you do very well i thank you piff paff poultry may i marry your sister oh yes if the father holinthe the mother malko the brother hugenstolz and the fair catherine are willing it may be so where is then the fair catherine in her chamber counting out her pennies good day fair catherine how do you do very well i thank you piff paff poultry will you be my bride oh yes if the father holinthe the mother malko the brother hugenstolz and the sister kestrout are willing so am i how much money have you fair catherine fourteen pennies in bare money two and a half farthings owing to me half a pound of dried apples and a handful of prunes and a handful of roots and don't you call that a capital dowry piff paff poultry what trade are you are you a tailor better than that a shoemaker better still a ploughman better still a joiner better still a smith better still a miller better still perhaps a broom binder yes so i am now is that not a pretty trade end of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by evan smith tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin Chapter 30. The Wolf and the Fox A wolf, once upon a time, caught a fox. It happened one day that they were both going through the forest, and the wolf said to his companion, Get me some food, or I will eat you up. The fox replied, I know a farmyard where there are a couple of young lambs, which, if you wish, we will fetch. This proposal pleased the wolf, so they went, and the fox, stealing first one of the lambs, brought it to the wolf and then ran away. The wolf devoured it quickly, but was not contented and went to fetch the other lamb by himself, but he did it so awkwardly that he aroused the attention of the mother, who began to cry and bleat loudly, so that the peasants ran up. 
There they found the wolf, and beat him so unmercifully that he ran, howling and limping, to the fox, and said, You have led me to a nice place, for when I went to fetch the other lamb, the peasants came and beat me terribly. Why are you such a glutton, then? asked the fox. The next day they went again into the fields, and the covetous wolf said to the fox, Get me something to eat now, or I will devour you. The fox said he knew a country house where the cook was going that evening to make some pancakes, and thither they went. When they arrived, the fox sneaked and crept around, round the house, until he at last discovered where the dish was standing, out of which he stole six pancakes and took them to the wolf, saying, There is something for you to eat, and then ran away. The wolf dispatched these in a minute or two, and wishing to taste some more, he went and seized the dish, but took it away so hurriedly that it broke in pieces. The noise of its fall brought out the woman, who, as soon as she saw the wolf, called her people, who, hastening up, beat him with such a good will that he ran home to the fox, howling with two lame legs. "'What a horrid place you have drawn me into now!' cried he. "'The peasants have caught me and dressed my skin finely.' "'Why, then, are you such a glutton?' said the fox. When they went out again the third day, the wolf limping along with weariness, he said to the fox, "'Get me something to eat now, or I will devour you.' The fox said he knew a man who had just killed a pig, and salted the meat down in a cask in his cellar, and that they could get at it. The wolf replied that he would go with him, on condition that he helped him if he could not escape. "'Oh, of course I will, on my own account,' said the fox." and showed him the tricks and ways by which they could get into the cellar. When they went in, there was meat in abundance, and the wolf was enraptured at the sight. The fox, too, had a taste, but kept looking around while eating, and ran frequently to the hole by which they had entered, to see if his body would slip through it easily. Presently the wolf asked, "'Why are you running about so, you fox, jumping in and out?' "'I want to see if anyone is coming,' replied the fox cunningly. "'But mind you do not eat too much.' The wolf said he would not leave till the cask was quite empty, and meanwhile the peasant, who had heard the noise made by the fox, entered the cellar. The fox, as soon as he saw him, made a spring and was through the hole in a jiffy, and the wolf tried to follow his example, but he had eaten so much that his body was too big for the opening, and he stuck fast. Then came the peasant with a cudgel and beat him sorely, but the fox leaped away into the forest, very glad to get rid of the old glutton. End of chapter 30. Recording by Evan Smith. Chapter 31 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum Chapter 31 Discreet Hans Hans's mother asked, Whither are you going, Hans? To Grethel's, replied he. Behave well, Hans. I will take care. Good-bye, mother. Good-bye, Hans. Hans came to Grethel. Good day, said he. Good day, replied Grethel. What treasure do you bring today? I bring nothing. Have you anything to give? Grethel presented Hans with a needle. Goodbye, said he. Goodbye, Hans. Hans took the needle, stuck it in a load of hay, and walked home behind the wagon. Good evening, mother. Good evening, Hans. Where have you been? To Grethel's. And what have you given her? nothing she has given me something what has grethel given you a needle said hans and where have you put it in the load of hay then you have behaved stupidly hans you should put needles on your coat sleeve to behave better do nothing at all thought hans whither are you going hans to grethel's mother behave well hans I will take care. Good-bye, mother. Good-bye, Hans. Hans came to Grethel. Good-day, said he. Good-day, Hans. What treasure do you bring? I bring nothing. Have you anything to give? Grethel gave Hans a knife. 
Goodbye, Grethel. Goodbye, Hans. Hans took the knife, put it in his sleeve, and went home. Good evening, mother. Good evening, Hans. Where have you been? To Grethel's. And what did you take her? I took nothing. She has given to me. And what did she give you? A knife, said Hans. And where have you put it? In my sleeve. Then you have behaved foolishly again, Hans. You should put knives in your pocket. To behave better, do nothing at all, thought Hans. Whither are you going, Hans? To Grethel's mother. Behave well, Hans. I will take care. Goodbye, mother. Goodbye, Hans. Hans came to Grethel. Good day, Grethel. Good day, Hans. What treasure do you bring? I bring nothing. Have you anything to give? Grethel gave Hans a young goat. Goodbye, Grethel. Goodbye, Hans. Hans took the goat, tied its legs, and put it in his pocket. Just as he reached home, it was suffocated. Good evening, mother. Good evening, Hans. Where have you been? To Grethel's. And what did you take her? I took nothing. She gave to me. And what did Grethel give you? A goat. Where did you put it, Hans? In my pocket. There you acted stupidly, Hans. You should have tied the goat with a rope. To behave better, do nothing, thought Hans. Whither away, Hans? To Grethel's, mother. Behave well, Hans. I'll take care. Goodbye, mother. Goodbye, Hans. Hans came to Grethel. Good day, said he. Good day, Hans. What treasure do you bring? I bring nothing. Have you anything to give? Grethel gives Hans a piece of bacon. Goodbye, Grethel. Goodbye, Hans. Hans took the bacon, tied it with a rope, and swung it to and fro so that the dogs came and ate it up. When he reached home, he held the rope in his hand, but there was nothing on it. Good evening, mother, said he. Good evening, Hans. Where have you been? To Grethel's mother. What did you take there? I took nothing. She gave to me. And what did Grethel give you? A piece of bacon, said Hans. And where have you put it? I tied it with a rope, swung it about, and the dogs came and ate it up. There you acted stupidly, Hans. You should have carried the bacon on your head. To behave better, do nothing, thought Hans. Whither away, Hans? To Grethel's, mother. Behave well, Hans. I'll take care. Goodbye, mother. Goodbye, Hans. Hans came to Grethel. Good day, said he. Good day, Hans. What treasure do you bring? I bring nothing. Have you anything to give? Grethel gave Hans a calf. Goodbye, said Hans. Goodbye. Hans took the calf, set it on his head, and the calf scratched his face. Good evening, mother. Good evening, Hans. Where have you been? To Grethel's. What did you take her? I took nothing. She gave to me. And what did Grethel give you? A calf, said Hans. And what did you do with it? I set it on my head, and it kicked my face. Then you acted stupidly, Hans. You should have led the calf home and put it in the stall. To behave better, do nothing, thought Hans. Whither away, Hans? To Grethel's, mother. Behave well, Hans. I'll take care. Goodbye, mother. Goodbye, Hans. Hans came to Grethel. Good day, said he. Good day, Hans. What treasure do you bring? I bring nothing. Have you anything to give? Grethel said, I will go with you, Hans. Hans tied a rope round Grethel, led her home, put her in the stall, and made the rope fast, 
and then he went to his mother good evening mother good evening hans where have you been to grethel's what did you take her i took nothing what did grethel give you she gave nothing she came with me and where have you left her then i tied her with a rope put her in the stall and threw in some grass then you acted stupidly hans you should have looked at her with friendly eyes to behave better do nothing thought hans and then he went into the stall and made sheep's eyes at grethel and after that grethel became hans's wife end of chapter 31 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter number 32 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin king thrush beard a certain king had a daughter who was beautiful above all belief but withal so proud and haughty that no suitor was good enough for her and she not only turned back every one who came but also made game of them all once the king proclaimed a great festival and invited thereto from far and near all the marriageable young men when they arrived they were all set in a row according to their rank and standing first the kings then the princes the dukes the marquises the earls and last of all the barons then the king's daughter was led down the rows but she found something to make game of it all one was too fat the wine tub said she another was too tall long and lanky has no grace she remarked a third was too short and fat too stout to have any wits said she a fourth was too pale like death himself was her remark and a fifth who had a great deal of color she called a cockatoo the sixth was not straight enough and him she called a green log scorched in the oven and so she went on nicknaming every one of the suitors but she made particularly merry with a good young king whose chin had grown rather crooked ha ha laughed she he has a chin like a thrush's beak and after that day he went by the name of Thrushbeard. The old king, however, when he saw that his daughter did nothing but mock at and make sport of all the suitors who were collected, became very angry and swore that she should take the first decent beggar for a husband who came to the gate. A couple of days after this a player came beneath the windows to sing and earn some bounty if he could as soon as the king saw him he ordered him to be called up and presently he came into the room in all his dirty ragged clothes and sang before the king and princess and when he had finished he begged for a slight recompense the king said thy song has pleased so much that i will give thee my daughter for a wife the princess was terribly frightened but the king said I have taken an oath and mean to perform it that i will give you to the first beggar all her recomstances were in vain the priest was called and the princess was married in earnest to the player when the ceremony was performed the king said now it cannot be suffered that you should stop here with your husband in my house no you must travel about the country with him so the beggar-man led her away and she was forced to trudge along with him on foot as they came to a large forest she asked to whom belongs this beautiful wood the echo replied 
King Thrushbeard the Good. Have you taken him? It has been thine. Ah, silly, said she, what a lot had been mine. Had I happily married King Thrushbeard? Next they came to a meadow, and she asked, To whom belongs this meadow so green? To King Thrushbeard was again the reply. Then they came to a great city, and she asked, To whom does this beautiful town belong? To King Thrushbeard, said one. Ah, what a simpleton was I that I did not marry him when I had the chance! exclaimed the poor princess. Come, broke in the player. It does not please me, I can tell you, that you are always wishing for another husband. Am I not good enough for you? By and by they came to a very small hut, and she said, Ah, heavens, to whom can this miserable, wretched hovel belong? The player replied, that is my house where we shall live together the princess was obliged to stoop to get in at the door and when she was inside she asked where are the servants what servants exclaimed her husband you must yourself do all that you want done now make a fire and put on some water that you may cook my dinner for i am quite tired the princess, however, understood nothing about making fires or cooking, and the beggar had to set to work himself, and as soon as they had finished their scanty meal they went to bed. In the morning the husband woke up his wife very early, that she might set the house to rights, and for a couple of days they lived on in this way and made an end of their store. Then the husband said, Wife, we must not go on in this way any longer. Stopping here, doing nothing, you must weave some baskets. So he went out and cut some oysters and brought them home, but when his wife attempted to bend them, the hard twigs wounded her hands and made them bleed. I see that won't suit, said her husband. You had better spin, perhaps that will do better. So she sat down to spin, but the harsh thread cut her tender fingers very badly, so that the blood flowed freely. Do you see, said the husband, how you are spoiling your work? I made a bad bargain in taking you. Now I must try and make a business in pots and earthen vessels. You shall sit in the market and sell them. Oh, if anybody out of my father's dominions should come and see me in the mark selling pots thought the princess to herself how they would laugh at me however all her excuses were in vain she must either do that or die of hunger the first time all went well for the people bought of the princess because she was so pretty looking and not only gave her what she asked but even some laid down their money and left the pots behind on her earnings this day they lived for some time as long as they lasted and then the husband purchased a fresh stock of pots with these she placed her stall at a corner of the market offering them for sale all at once a drunken hussar came plunging down the street on his horse and rode right into the midst of her earthenware and shattered it into a thousand pieces the accident as well it might set her a weeping and in her trouble not knowing what to do she ran home crying ah what will become of me what will my good man say when she had told her husband he cried out whoever would have thought of sitting at the corner of the market to sell earthenware but well i see you are not accustomed to any ordinary work there leave off crying i have been to the king's palace and asked if they were not in want of a kitchen maid and they have agreed to take you and there you will live free of cost now the princess became a kitchen maid and was obliged to do as the cook bade her 
and wash up the dirty things. Then she put a jar into each of her pockets, and in them she took home what was left of what fell to her share of the good things, and of these she and her husband made their meals. Not many days afterward it happened that the wedding of the king's eldest son was to be celebrated, and the poor wife placed herself near the door of the saloon to look on. As the lamps were lit and guests more and more beautiful entered the room, and all dressed more scumptiously, she reflected on her fate with a saddened heart, and repented of the pride and haughtiness which had so humiliated and impoverished her. Every now and then the servants threw her out of the dishes morsels of rich delicacies which they carried in, whose fragrant smells increased her regrets, and these pieces she put into her pockets to carry home. Presently the king entered, clothed in silk and velvet, and having a golden chain round his neck. As soon as he saw the beautiful maiden standing at the door, he seized her by the hand and would dance with her, but she, terribly frightened, refused, for she saw it was the king Thrushbeard, who had wooed her and whom she had laughed at. Her struggles were of no avail. He drew her into the ballroom, and there tore off the band to which the pots were attached, so that they fell down and the soup ran over the floor while the pieces of meat, etc., skipped about in all directions. When the fine folk saw this sight, they burst into one universal shout of laughter and derision, and the poor girl was so ashamed that she wished herself a thousand fathoms below the earth. She ran out at the door and would have escaped, but on the steps she met a man, who took her back, and when she looked at him, lo! It was King Thrushbeard again. He spoke kindly to her, and said, Be not afraid. I and the musician, who dealt with you in the wretched hut, are one. For love of you I have acted thus, and the husser who rode in among the pots was also myself. All this has taken place in order to humble your haughty disposition, and to punish you for your pride which led you to mock me. At these words she wept bitterly, and said, I am not worthy to be your wife. I have done you so great a wrong. But he replied, Those evil days are past. We will now celebrate our marriage. Immediately after came the bridesmaids, and put on her the most magnificent dresses, and then her father and his whole court arrived and wished her happiness on her wedding day, and now commenced her true joy as queen of the country of King Thrush Beard. End of chapter 32 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 33 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Three Luck Children. There was once upon a time a father who called his three sons to him and gave the first a cock, the second a scythe, and the third a cat, and then addressed them thus, I am very old, and my end draweth nigh, but I wish to show my care for you before I die. Money I have not, and what I now give you appears of little worth, but do not think that for if each of you use his gift carefully and seek some country where such a thing is not known, your fortunes will be made. Soon after the father died, and the eldest son set out on his travels with his cock. But wherever he came, such a creature was already well known. In the towns he saw it from afar, 
sitting upon the church steeples and turning itself round with the wind and in the villages he heard more than one crow and nobody troubled himself about another so that it did not seem as if he would ever make his fortune by it at last however it fell out that he arrived on an island where the people knew nothing about cocks not even how to divide their time they knew certainly when it was evening and morning but at night if they did not sleep through it they could not comprehend the time see he said to them what a proud creature it is what a fine red crown it wears on its head and it has spurs like a knight thrice during the night it will crow at certain hours and the third time it calls you may know the sun will rise soon but if it crows by day you may prepare then for a change of weather the good people were well pleased and the whole night they laid awake and listened to the cock which crowed loudly and clearly at two four and six o'clock the next day they asked if the creature were not for sale and how much he asked and he replied as much gold as an ass can bear a ridiculously small sum they say for such a marvelous creature and gave him readily what he asked when he returned home with his money his brothers were astonished and the second said he would also go out and see what luck his scythe would bring him but at first it did not seem likely that fortune would favor him for all the countrymen he met carried equally good skies upon their shoulders at last however he also came to an island where people were ignorant of the use of skies for when a field of corn was ripe they planted great cannons and shot it down in this way it was no uncommon thing that many of them shot quite over it others hit the ears instead of the stalks and shot them quite away so that a great quantity was always ruined and the most doleful laminations ensued but our hero when he arrived mowed away so silently and quickly that the people held their breath and noses with wonder and willingly gave him what he desired which was a horse laden with as much gold as it could carry on his return the third brother set out with his cat to try his luck and it happened to him exactly as it had done to the others so long as he kept on the old roads he met with no place which did not already boast its cat indeed so many were there that the new-born kittens were usually drowned at last he voyaged to an island where luckily for him cats were unknown animals and yet the mice were so numerous that they danced upon the tables and chairs whether the master of the house were at home or not these people complained continually of the plague and the king himself knew not how to deliver them from it for in every corner the mice were swarming and destroyed what they could not carry away in their teeth the cat however on its arrival commenced a grand hunt and so soon cleared a couple of rooms of the troublesome visitors that the people begged the king to buy it for the use of his kingdom the king gave willingly the price that was asked for the wonderful animal and the third brother returned home with a still larger treasure in the shape of a mule laden with gold meanwhile the cat was having capital sport in the royal palace with the mice and bit so many that the dead were not to be numbered at last she became very thirsty with the hot work and stopped and raising her head cried meow meow at the unusual sound the king together with all his courtiers were much frightened and in terror they ran out of the castle there the king held a council what it were best to do and at length it was resolved to send a herald to the cat to demand that she should quit the castle or force would be used to make her for said the councillors we would rather be plagued by the mice 
to which we are accustomed than surrender ourselves a prey to this beast a page was accordingly sent to the cat to ask whether she would quit the castle in peace but the cat whose thirst had all the while been increasing replied nothing but meow meow the page understood her to say no no and brought the king word accordingly the councillors agreed then that she should feel their power and cannons were brought out and fired so that the castle was presently in flames when the fire reached the room where the cat was she sprang out of the window but the besiegers ceased not until the hole was leveled with the ground end of chapter thirty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter thirty four of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by christine layman reseda california tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter thirty four the three sluggards a certain king had three sons all of whom he loved so much that he did not know which he should name to be king after him when the day of his death approached he called them to his bedside and thus spoke to them dear children i have something on my mind that i wish to tell you whichever of you is the laziest he shall be king when i am dead then father the kingdom belongs to me said the eldest son for i am so lazy that if i lie down to sleep and tears come into my eyes so that i cannot close them i yet go to sleep without wiping them away the kingdom belongs to me cried the second son for i am so lazy that when i sit by the fire to warm myself i allow my boots to scorch before i will draw away my feet but the third son said the kingdom is mine father for i am so lazy that were i about to be hanged and even had i the rope round my neck and any one should give me a sharp sword to cut it with i should suffer myself to be swung off before i took the trouble to cut the rope as soon as his father heard this he said to his youngest son you have shown yourself the laziest of all and you shall be king end of chapter thirty four recording by christine layman reseda california chapter thirty five of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 35 The Fisherman and His Wife There was once a fisherman who lived with his wife in a miserable little hovel close to the sea. He went to fish every day, and he fished and fished, and at last one day, when he was sitting looking deep down into the shining water he felt something on his line when he hauled it up there was a great flounder on the end of the line the flounder said to him look here fisherman don't you kill me i am no common flounder i am an enchanted prince what good will it do you to kill me i shan't be good to eat put me back into the water and leave me to swim about well said the fisherman you need not make so many words about it i am quite ready to put back a flounder that can talk and so saying he put back the flounder into the shining water and it sank down to the bottom leaving a streak of blood behind it then the fisherman got up and went back to his wife in the hovel husband she said hast thou caught nothing to-day no said the man all i caught was one flounder and he said he was an enchanted prince so i let him go swim again didst thou not wish for anything then asked the good wife no said the man what was there to wish for alas said his wife isn't it bad enough always to live in this wretched hovel thou mightest at least have wished for a nice clean cottage go back and call him 
Tell him I want a pretty cottage. He will surely give us that. Alas, said the man, what am I to go back there for? Well, said the woman, it was thou who caught him and let him go again. For certain he will do that for thee. Be off now. The man was still not very willing to go, but he did not want to vex his wife. And at last he went back to the sea. He found the sea no longer bright and shining, but dull and green. He stood by it and said, Flounder, flounder in the sea, pry thee hearken unto me. My wife, Ilsebil, will have her own way. Whatever I wish, whatever I say. The flounder came swimming up and said, Well, what do you want? Alas, said the man, I had to call you, for my wife said I ought to have wished for something as I caught you. She doesn't want to live in a miserable hovel any longer. She wants a pretty cottage. Go home again, then, said the flounder. She has her wish fully. The man went home and found his wife no longer in the old hut, but a pretty little cottage stood in its place, and his wife was sitting on a bench by the door. She took him by the hand and said, Come and look in here. Isn't this much better? They went inside and found a pretty sitting room and a bedroom with a bed in it, a kitchen and a larder furnished with everything of the best in tin and brass and every possible requisite. Outside there was a little yard with chickens and ducks and a little garden full of vegetables and fruit. Look, said the woman, is not this nice? Yes, said the man, and so let it remain. We can live here very happily. We will see about that, said the woman, and with that they ate something and went to bed. Everything went well for a week or more. And then said the wife, Listen, husband, this cottage is too cramped and the garden is too small. The flounder might have given us a bigger house. I want to live in a big stone castle. Go to the flounder and tell him to give us a castle. Alas, wife, said the man, the cottage is good enough for us. What should we do with a castle? Never mind, said his wife. Do thou but go to the flounder, and he will manage it. Nay, wife, said the man, the flounder gave us the cottage. I don't want to go back. As likely as not, he'll be angry. Go all the same, said the woman. He can do it easily enough, and willingly into the bargain. Just go. The man's heart was heavy, and he was very unwilling to go. He said to himself, It's not right. But at last he went. He found the sea was no longer green. It was still calm, but dark, violet, and grey. He stood by it and said, Flounder, flounder in the sea, pry thee hearken unto me. My wife, Ilsebil, will have her own way. Whatever I wish, whatever I say. Now what do you want? said the flounder. Alas, said the man, half scared. My wife wants a big stone castle. Go home again, said the flounder. She is standing at the door of it. Then the man went away, thinking he would find no house. But when he got back, he found a great stone palace, and his wife standing at the top of the steps, waiting to go in. She took him by the hand and said, Come in with me. With that, they went in and found a great hall paved with marble slabs, a number of servants in attendance, who opened the great doors for them. The walls were hung with beautiful tapestries, and the rooms were furnished with golden chairs and tables, while rich carpets covered the floors, and crystal chandeliers hung from the ceilings. The tables groaned under every kind of delicate food and the most costly wines. Outside the house there was a great courtyard with stabling for horses and cows and many fine carriages. Beyond this, there was a great garden filled with the loveliest flowers and fine fruit trees. There was also a park half a mile long, and in it were stags and hinds and hares and everything of the kind one could wish for. Now, said the woman, is not this worth having? Oh, yes, said the man, and so let it remain. We will live in this beautiful palace and be content. We will think about that, said his wife and sleep upon it. With that, they went to bed. Next morning, the wife woke up first. Day was just dawning, and from her bed, she could see the beautiful country around her. Her husband was still asleep, but she pushed him with her elbow and said, Husband, 
get up and peep out of the window. See here, now, could we not be king over all this land? Go to the flounder, we will be king. Alas, wife, said the man, what should we be king for? I don't want to be king. Ah, said his wife, if thou wilt not be king, I will. Go to the flounder, I will be king. Alas, wife, said the man, whatever dost thou want to be king for? I don't like to tell him. Why not, said the woman, go thou must, I will be king. So the man went, but he was quite sad, because his wife would be king. It is not right, he said, it is not right. When he reached the sea, he found it dark, grey and rough and evil smelling. He stood there and said, Flounder, flounder in the sea, pry thee hearken unto me. My wife, Ilsebil, will have her own way, whatever I wish, whatever I say. Now what does she want? said the flounder. Alas, said the man, she wants to be king now. Go back, she is king already, said the flounder. So the man went back, and when he reached the palace, he found that it had grown much larger, and a great tower had been added with handsome decorations. There was a sentry at the door, and numbers of soldiers were playing drums and trumpets. As soon as he got inside the house, he found everything was marble and gold, and the hangings were of velvet, with great golden tassels. The doors of the saloon were thrown wide open, and he saw the whole court assembled. His wife was sitting on a lofty throne of gold and diamonds. She wore a golden crown, and carried in one hand a scepter of pure gold. On each side of her stood her ladies in a long row, each one a head shorter than the next. He stood before her and said, Alas, wife, art thou now king? Yes, she said, I am now king. He stood looking at her for some time, and then he said, Ah, wife, it is a fine thing for thee to be king. Now we will not wish to be anything more. Nay, husband, she answered, quite uneasily. I find the time hangs very heavy on my hands. I can't bear it any longer. Go back to the flounder. King I am, but I must also be emperor. Alas, wife, said the man, why dost thou want to be emperor? Husband, she answered, go to the flounder. Emperor, I will be. Alas, wife, said the man, emperor, he can't make thee. I won't ask him. There is only one emperor in the country. And emperor, the flounder cannot make thee, that he can't. What? said the woman. I am king, and thou art but my husband. To him thou must go, and that right quickly. If he can make me king, he can also make me emperor. Emperor I will be, so quickly go. He had to go, but he was quite frightened. And as he went, he thought, this won't end well. Emperor is too shameless. The flounder will make an end of the whole thing. With that, he came to the sea, but now he found it quite black and heaving up from below in great waves. It tossed to and fro, and a sharp wind blew over it, and the man trembled. So he stood there and said, Flounder, flounder in the sea, pry thee hearken unto me. My wife, Ilsebil, will have her own way. Whatever I wish, whatever I say. What does she want now? said the flounder. Alas, flounder, he said. My wife wants to be emperor. Go back, said the flounder. She is emperor. So the man went back, and when he got to the door, he found that the whole palace was made of a polished marble, with alabaster figures and golden decorations. Soldiers marched up and down before the doors blowing their trumpets and beating their drums. Inside the palace, courts, barons and dukes walked about as attendants. They opened to him the doors, which were of pure gold. He went in and saw his wife sitting on a huge throne made of solid gold. It was at least two miles high. She had on her head a great golden crown set with diamonds, three yards high, in one hand, she held a scepter, and in the other, a ball of empire. On each side of her stood the gentlemen at arms in two rows, each one a little smaller than the other. 
from giants two miles high down to the tiniest dwarfs no bigger than my little finger. She was surrounded by princes and dukes. Her husband stood still and said, Wife, art thou now emperor? Yes, she said, I am now emperor. Then he looked at her for some time and said, Alas, wife, how much better off art thou for being emperor? Husband, she said, what art thou standing there for? Now I am emperor, I mean to be pope. Go back to the flounder. Alas, wife, said the man, what wilt thou not want? Pope thou canst not be. There is only one pope in Christendom. That's more than the flounder can do. Husband, she said, pope I will be, so go at once. I must be pope this very day. No, wife, he said, I dare not tell him. It's no good. It's too monstrous altogether. The flounder cannot make thee pope. Husband, said the woman, don't talk to nonsense. If he can make an emperor, he can make a pope. Go immediately, I am emperor, and thou art but my husband, and thou must obey. So he was frightened and went, but he was quite dazed. He shivered and shook, and his knees trembled. A great wind arose over the land. The clouds flew across the sky, and it grew as dark as night. The leaves fell from the trees, and the water foamed and dashed upon the shore. In the distance, the ships were being tossed to and fro on the waves, and he heard them firing signals of distress. There was still a little patch of blue in the sky among the dark clouds, but towards the south they were red and heavy, as in a bad storm. In despair, he stood and said, Flounder, flounder in the sea, cry thee hearken unto me. My wife, Ilsebil, will have her own way, whatever I wish, whatever I say. Now what does she want? said the flounder. Alas, said the man, she wants to be Pope. Go back, Pope she is, said the flounder. So back he went, and he found a great church, surrounded with palaces, he pressed through the crowd, and inside he found thousands and thousands of lights. And his wife, entirely clad in gold, was sitting on a still higher throne, with three golden crowns upon her head. And she was surrounded with priestly state. On each side of her were two rows of candles, the biggest as thick as a tower down to the tiniest little taper. Kings and emperors were on their knees before her kissing her shoe. Wife, said the man, looking at her, art thou now Pope? Yes, she said, I am now Pope. So there he stood, gazing at her, and it was like looking at a shining sun. Alas, wife, he said, art thou better off for being Pope? At first she sat as stiff as a post, without stirring. Then he said, now, wife, be content with being Pope. Higher thou canst not go. I will think about that, said the woman, and with that they both went to bed. Still she was not content, and could not sleep for her inordinate desires. The man slept well and soundly, for he had walked about a great deal in the day. But his wife could think of nothing but what future grandeur she could demand. When the dawn reddened the sky, she raised herself up in bed and looked out of the window. And when she saw the sun rise, she said, Ha! Can I not cause the sun and the moon to rise? Husband, she cried, digging her elbow into his side. Wake up and go to the flounder. I will be lord of the universe. Her husband, who was still more than half asleep, was so shocked that he fell out of bed. He thought he must have heard wrong. He rubbed his eyes and said, Alas, wife, what didst thou say? Husband, she said, If I cannot be lord of the universe and cause the sun and the moon to set and rise, I shall not be able to bear it. I shall never have another happy moment. She looked at him so wildly that it caused a shudder to run through him. Alas, wife, he said, falling on his knees before her, the flounder can't do that. Emperor and pope he can make, but that is indeed beyond him. I pray thee, control thyself and remain pope. Then she flew into a terrible rage. Her hair stood on end. She panted for breath and screamed, I won't bear it any longer. Wilt thou go? 
then he pulled on his trousers and tore away like a madman such a storm was raging that he could hardly keep his feet house and trees quivered and swayed mountains trembled and the rocks rolled into the sea the sky was pitchy black it thundered and lightened and the sea ran in black waves mountains high crested with white foam he shrieked out but could hardly make himself heard flounder flounder in the sea pray thee hearken unto me my wife ilsebil will have her own way whatever i wish whatever i say now what does she want asked the flounder alas he said she wants to be lord of the universe now she must go back to her old hovel said the flounder and there you will find her and there they are to this very day end of chapter thirty five the fisherman and his wife